Welcome to Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, bringing you this fan-based but band-endorsed podcast. Uh, you know, so here we are back for another season. We've covered all the albums. We've covered all the bonus tracks. But have we? You know, I thought this was going to be very simple. 25 seasons because I knew the band was going to have another album out by the time I caught up to it or close to it. So I thought 25 seasons, uh, season of interviews, you know, all good. Right. But yet I keep finding things. So I have to give a big shout out for this season and the next season to my friend Mike Shannon, who is one of the admins and moderators of the group on Facebook, Friends Who Like Uriah Heep. He reached out to me and let me know about two albums that I saw, but completely blew off as not relevant to the podcast. So thank you very much, Mike. Let me tell you what happened. He told me that the album Totally Driven and the album Celebration were actually studio recorded albums. And I looked at them and I'm like, yeah, I looked at these. They're all, you know, it's a best of, right? It's a compilation. I had grabbed a couple of bonus tracks off of celebrations for the shows, um, you, you know, during the, the course of the podcast that were bonus tracks. Um, but those were not on the remastered versions of the CDs that I purchased. So I was able to find those. And, you know, my promise in the beginning was I would present everything that the band ever recorded in the studio. But I thought these were just, you know, basically, uh, you know, grabbed off of uh, Look at Yourself and all the, the different albums and made into a compilation. Apparently what these are, are these are actually re-recordings of the band in the current state of the band at the time these were done, going back into the studio and re-recording their own songs. So that's why I missed them, uh, because it's the band covering their own songs where I thought it was a compilation. So, here we are, totally driven from what I've read, was a kind of a ramp up for the acoustically driven album, uh, which I won't be covering because that was a live album. But this one uh, is pretty interesting. I'm going to talk about the cover first. Um, right off the bat, it's uh, very interesting. And the first thing that strikes me, obviously, is the classic, uh, very cool Uriah Heap logo at the top. Uh, very plain, all lowercase font, like uh, an old uh, IBM Selectric typewriter at the bottom that says Totally Driven. Um, I'm not really sure why the title of the album is so subtle or subdued. It's kind of weird. But in the middle, we see this big head with all kinds of gears on it. Someone dressed in period clothing that appears to be flying this thing. We see a propeller in the back and a propeller on top. Very H.G. Wells time machine reminiscent to me. That's the first thing that I think of when I see this image, especially with the gears there. They're kind of steampunk, but it's the, the guy's clothing that really put it in that H.G. Wells period for me. And the uh, ship is in the shape of a head. I don't know why. It's not very aerodynamic. <laughs> I don't know um, who would fly this thing. And it's also very heavy. And I can't imagine this poor guy's tiny, thin little legs could pedal those propellers enough to get this thing anywhere near off the ground. But magically, he is in the air flying over modern cities. So um, you can't really discern much from the cities themselves. The buildings are very big. Uh, the, the city in the front at the very bottom looks kind of old. And then in the middle, you've got a strip of island. And then in the back, you have another city. So I, I can't tell if the front city is European or Italian or like, uh, you know, British or Italian or what. It might be Italian because it's got the waterfront there. Um, really large construction buildings. They look very old. So I'm guessing that's representing Europe. In the middle, that strip of island that you have uh, appears to have the Statue of Liberty on the very left-hand side. So I'm going to guess that that might be Ellis Island, uh, maybe more than just Ellis Island. But 
Uh, it, it appears that that's what that represents to me. And in the back, I have no idea. The city is is really kind of faded out. You really can't discern anything. I don't know if that's supposed to be America or New York or or what that is. Um, if that's Ellis Island, and I'm right about the bottom part being Europe. I'm going to assume that that middle part is America. Have absolutely no clue. Um, the rest of it is is a combination of sun and clouds. Uh, very nicely done, but definitely represents that Bronze Age over modern times kind of feel. I don't know if that's a representation of the new band recording the old music or what. I have no idea. All I can say is just taking a look at the album cover, not representing it with the music. It's pretty cool. Um, I like it. I I'm a fan. I haven't thought about that H.G. Wells movie. I can't even think of what it was called now. But there was a movie about his time machine that came out in the 80s as well. Um, so very cool. A quick uh, look at who's in the band at the point that they're recording this, because obviously that's very important. This is the current band's timestamp of these songs over the period of their career up to this point. And it's very close to the modern lineup. Uh, we have on vocals, we have Bernie Shaw. On guitar, we have Mick Box. On bass, we have Trevor Boulder. On drums, we have Lee Kerslake. And on keys, we have, of course, Phil Lanzon, because when Bernie joined the band was at the same time Phil joined the band. And so, of course, they would be here together. So this is pre-Russell Gilbrook, pre-Dave Rimmer, and back to that uh, previous lineup before those guys joined at their respective times. We're going back to the beginning, um, you know, back to the, the earliest days of the band. I don't think these are really in any particular order uh, as far as the the timeline of the band's original recordings. I think these are just kind of all put on the album more what the um, record company or, or producer thought would flow better because they don't seem to be time stamped in order. But this is the first song on disc one of this two disc set. Um, yeah, they're definitely not because Traveler in Time is number three and Bird of Prey is, or is uh, Traveler in Time is number two, Bird of Prey is number three. Then we go to Sunrise. Then right, Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. So it might have just been the uh, just the flow that they thought would work better for this arrangement of songs, not in that uh, not in the order that they were originally recorded, which a lot of times would not necessarily work as far as the best flow from one song to the next. But we're going back to Gypsy, guys, the uh, the beginning of the band, the very first song that I reviewed. And it's going to be interesting to see how it sounds with this current band. Uh, before we get into that, uh, one little bit of house cleaning I'm going to do today. Looking back at the uh, feedback on the show across the world, there are a couple of reviews that I don't believe I've read on the show yet. This one came in uh, January 17th of 2022 from Canada, and this is from C.D. Morissette. I'm going to say I know that's my buddy Corey from uh, the Backtracks Aerosmith podcast that I do with him and John Mariano. A lot of fun since I've joined that. Learned so much about Aerosmith, a band that honestly I did not know that much about. I knew a couple of their albums very well and a couple of hits and really not much more than that. So it was really cool to uh, to start working with him. He also does another show called Backtracks Theme Music that he does with uh, John Mariano. And then he does a show called And the Podcast Will Rock with Mark Kameyer, a show on Van Halen. And I've been a guest on both of those shows a couple of times. Lots of fun. All great guys. Uh, love working with them. And Corey wrote in and he said, I love this show. I went in not knowing much about Uriah Heap, but thanks to this podcast, I'm becoming a big fan. Great deep dive analysis. And the host is very knowledgeable and easy to listen to. A must for all music fans. Well, thank you, Corey. I find you very enjoyable and easy to listen to as well, considering the amount of time I spend listening to you each week. <laughs> that, that certainly helps because uh, I listen to, uh, obviously, all of the podcasts that you are a part of uh, and enjoy uh, each of them very much in their own right. Actually, I, I take that back. I don't actually listen to the Aerosmith podcast anymore, and that's only because I'm on it. So I don't need to listen to the episodes because I was there for them, and I really don't like to listen back to the sound of my own voice. So uh, I, I don't listen to the Aerosmith show, and I don't listen to the episodes of Backtracks Theme Music or and the podcast will rock if I was on them. Um, might be kind of weird. I don't know, but I was there. I've already heard them, and that frees me up to listen to other things during that time. Plus, I already know what I said. So there's that. Then we have an updated 
bit of feedback from our friend at HD 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 B B B D B B that one uh, that was originally done in uh, November of 2021. There was an update uh, in June of 2022. Most recent uh, bit of feedback we've got is not a lot of people have left reviews, which uh, which is a shame because that really helps the podcast get seen regardless of whether it's positive or negative. The number of people who took time to say something, to give it a star rating, to to actually put in thoughts, um, that does help the podcast get seen on iTunes and, and uh, Apple Podcasts. But anyway, thank you for for uh, updating your feedback and leaving me too. That's pretty cool. Uh, this one says, updated June 2022. This show is still great. The host provides interesting commentary on each individual song. Start at the beginning and make your way through. It is good to listen to during long drives or flights or just while doing things around the house. You will learn to appreciate all things your eye heap. New info. So glad that he decided to cover the best live album and the Spice songs. The interviews were great, too. Now we have to wait for some new Uriah Heap. Keep up the great work, Scott. Well, hopefully I have. Uh, I've covered the new album. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Loved every bit of it, as you guys who listened to those episodes heard. Um, enjoyed the uh, the bonus track of the original version of one of the songs that we could kind of see the uh, the growth period from the original finished demo all the way out to what Uriah Heap did with it. And I, I really enjoyed that. I wish we could get more of that kind of stuff because I'm a, you know, I'm one of those people who really likes to understand, and maybe it's just more me as a musician or as a producer, but I really like to understand how things came to be, how the bands write their songs, how they end up with the final product. I also just like to enjoy the music, but then there's that other hat or other hats, I should say that I wear that put me in that position. So Without further ado, let's get right into the song. I say right after, after like 12 minutes of, of talking about all the things. This is Gypsy by the current, at the time, incarnation of Uriah Heap. Wow, this really feels like a live song, doesn't it? Um really just cranking right in no dramatic intro or anything just boom right into it uh just uh, hey here's the riff and we're gonna dig in uh up tempo for sure from the original um but this band you know as this band has been touring like lee and and trevor have been playing these songs for a long time and they're only using used to playing them live so they're probably going to just by nature be a little bit faster um, even if they started slow, I think the tendency would be how I know the song is faster than this. And I think there would just be that automatic speed up. So I like that they're starting it out a little bit faster. It just kind of feels like they're getting a board recording off the stage at one of the concerts. But it, yet it has the quality of a studio song. Wow, this really does sound like it was recorded in a theater, I have to say. Um, it, somewhere in my imagination, I was actually filling in crowd noise when Bernie started singing. But this feels very raw, very in the moment, lots of energy. Um, I really feel like there's an audience in front of all of this. It's It's really weird. He told me to go. It's really nice to hear the old style backing vocals right now because the last couple of albums that I've covered, you know, uh, Cast and Color, Live in the Dream, they've really gotten away from this style of backing vocals that they had been doing all along. And it's uh, a lot more Bernie with other voices layered in, I think. But it's not that whole, you know, multi-pitch chorus of sound that we used to hear uh, in, in the previous days. So it's really kind of nice to hear that again. Uh, you know, I have 
since I, I was done recording the episodes, I have gone back and listened to a bit of Uriah Heep. I really don't listen to music that much anymore unless I'm doing a, a review. Um, that's when I, I get the most time because I'm working on projects and I don't listen to music when I'm working on music. And it's really hard when I'm working on books to listen to most kinds of music. So um, it's very limited what I do. But when I've gone back and listened to Uriah Heep, I've realized just how much they've changed over the years. I really love their sound now. I really do. I think it's it's ballsy, it's edgy, it's powerful, but it, the dynamics of the band have just changed. They've evolved over the years. So it's nice to go back and hear some of that charm that we had in the previous days as you know, as they were evolving into where we currently are now. Quite a time Came back with her On my mind Like a sweet little girl She means all the world Yeah, the arrangement uh, Seems a little bit different too It's it's definitely uh just sped up and, and chopped down a little bit. The song is only three minutes and 53 seconds, and that seems short for this one to me. So uh, I'm guessing we're we're going to have a lot of the stuff cut out that we're used to hearing. But then again, this is what the band was probably playing live at the time. Not bad at all, but it really, God, it really feels like I'm at a private uh, warm-up, you know, at a concert, like a, uh, maybe a sound check or something like that. It has that theater feel to it, it has the speed of a live song. Um, yeah, this is going to be an interesting thing to review. At first, I kind of went into this with a little bit of, and what am I going to say? I, I've reviewed Gypsy already, did a live version of it already. You know, what more can I say about the same song? And it really looked at most of the songs like that. Some of them, they, they only had one review. Some of them were on uh, Live in 73. But in general, um, it's it's going to be kind of interesting because it sounds like each of these versions very may well be unique. So it looks like there is stuff to talk about. So uh, could make for a good season. I don't know. This is only the first episode. I'm only uh, almost halfway through the first song. So we'll see how it goes. Here's a little bit more. That's different. Um, not a big fan of synth brass. So that sound itself isn't uh, particularly pleasing to me, although it did make it feel more cinematic, didn't it? It kind of like uh, this was something that belonged in a, in a film score. Um, couldn't quite picture like a Rocky workout montage or a Rocky getting out his anger and frustration montage. Not that kind of cinematic, but it, it definitely had a... Um, I don't really completely change the feel of the song. Love what Mick was doing in the background, just working with the wah pedal. And, and uh, that really filled up the background nicely. Uh, great bass playing and solid drums, of course. 
but really a completely different feel and direction for the song. Uh, very interesting. I, I thought it works. You know, this is the kind of time, though, where you have to not compare versions so much and, and you know, maybe a little bit here and there, but really it's about what they're presenting to you right now. So it's really just about how do you feel about this version of the song as it is? Not how do you feel about it compared to the original, not which one is better, you know, or anything else. Just do you like this one? Yes or no. Do you like this part? Yes or no. Like I said, I don't normally like synth brass and this definitely felt pretty dark. It was a real unexpected direction, but I thought it was cool. I, I actually do like that. really like that feel on the change in drums there. Those three hits that da, da, da. That's actually really nice. I thought he was just going to do it the one time uh, transitioning back. But I, when he did it the second time, I'm like, wow, OK, that is really cool. Would have been one thing just like in the moment to throw something in, but to actually make it a more defined part of the song by doing it in repetition um, definitely made it seem a, a little more um, specifically planned unless he just did it spontaneously the first time and was like, I really like that. I'm going to do that again. But very nice. Again, just changes the feel of the song by dragging a note, you know, just or putting one note in, uh, playing that part a little bit slower than the tempo of the song instead of just, you know, on the beats where it should be. Um, really just makes it all so much more dramatic. The kind of a man... What a powerful ending. Love that. Love the reverb that they're using on this. Uh, like I said, it really, really felt like we were in a theater the whole time. Not like a huge uh, stadium or anything, but just like, you know, a, a decent sized concert hall, like maybe a House of Blues or something like that, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, but it felt it felt cavernous, you know, which is nice. But it really felt like we were at a sound check because it's, you know, a song that they might play to test the equipment. There's no crowd noise. It feels like we're in a live venue and not a studio, which I really like. I like that it doesn't have that, you know, dry padded studio sound where they're using reverbs to make it sound alive. I like that it actually sounds like it was recorded in a live venue. Um, I don't know whether it was or not yet, but the the idea of this uh, the sound of it is exactly fantastic because, you know, to just go into the studio and cut the songs again seems kind of silly to me, especially this. there's like 27 songs on this package. And we have another album like this to cover that they did later, uh, which we'll get to in the next season. So that's a lot of songs to be going in and re-recording. So there should be something different, different arrangements, different tempo, um, you know, different sounds different venue, different some, like there should just be some different stuff. Otherwise, what's the point? I and mean, what is it for the fans? You know? Um, so it's very interesting. I think we're off to a good start so far. I, I'm very curious to hear what the other songs are going to sound like. I did not listen uh, to any of it. So all this is new to me getting first uh, impressions on every episode. So even Lady in Black, I didn't even listen to that. I was tempted because I was curious to hear, you know, what this was going to sound like with the current incarnation. But uh, I didn't. I chose not to. Um, we'll see how they go. It's going to be fun. We'll get to song number two tomorrow. In the meantime, have a great day, guys. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. 
And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days. <laughs>